A long time ago, one of the warning messages launched by the scientists referred to the uh, threshold beyond which the average temperature should not rise. And this was said a long time ago because uh, this threshold was already mentioned in the uh, climate convention adopted in Rio in 92. The two degrees Celsius figure has uh, held the forefront of the uh, discussions and negotiations until today. But this temperature elevation must be connected with the anthropic uh, emission, gas emissions, those emissions that are due to human activity, which are partly responsible for the problem. The greenhouse effect gases of uh, anthropic origin are therefore expressed as CO2 equivalents, or rather tons of CO2 equivalents, or even gigatons of CO2 equivalents, 10 at the power of 9 of tons of CO2 equivalents. Then the CO2 tons are connected with cycles and concentration levels in the atmosphere of CO2 gases then expressed in parts per million or ppms, i.e. the part of uh, CO2 or other greenhouse effect gases uh, molecules present in the atmosphere per million of molecules. Therefore, this provides a equivalent metrics or measurement techniques where the threshold of two degrees that should not be exceeded is connected with a concentration level of greenhouse effect gases expressed in ppm, i.e. 450 ppm that should not be exceeded, or expressed in tons of CO2 equivalents of emission. And we know that by 2050, we must divide the world, the global emissions, uh, versus the level they had reached in 1990. This provides a very clear vision of the climate objective. But what is the current situation? And what about the uh, greenhouse effect gases that are currently present in the atmosphere? On this graph, you see all of the greenhouse effect gases measured between 1970 and 2010. I'd like to make an observation. The greenhouse effect gas emission levels over the last four years account for half of all the gases that were emitted ever since the beginning of the industrial era, i.e. 1850. Now, let us review the situation and let us look at the graph starting from the bottom, carbon dioxide deriving from fuel, fossil fuel combustion and industrial processes, more than 60%. Then carbon dioxide, CO2, coming from forestry and land use, uh, forest fires or peat fires. And here we need to talk about net emissions. The balance between the source and the carbon uptake in the sinks. In red, we have methane, or rather in blue, we have methane with two types of uh, sources of emission marshes, uh, wetland, uh, oceans, termites, and synthetic sources such as uh, fossil fuel combustion and digestive processes that we hear about in the press. There is also nitrous oxide, a uh, very powerful greenhouse effect gas, partly responsible for the destruction of the ozone layer. The emissions of nitrous oxide come from the ground, from the ocean, and the use of uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers or organic matter or fossil matter combustion. In France, agriculture is going to account for about three quarters of the uh, nitrous oxide uh, emissions. Finally, the last gas, there, isn't a, there is a small quantity, but its growth must be considered, fluoride gases, because in Europe they account for 2% of the uh, greenhouse effect gas emissions. 
These statistics are rather difficult to use and understand because it is necessary to uh, measure different sources, list the sources, and also identify the greenhouse effect gases. Scientists and researchers who publish reports use a very large database as a reference data, and they also talk about uncertainties, i.e. how far we can move away from the uh, measurements shown in the graphs. Now, the graph we're looking at together shows that two gases, nitrous oxide and another one, have uh, strong variations, about 60% for nitrous oxide and CO2 deriving from forestry and uh, land use. Here, the uncertainty is about 50%. So, we have reviewed the gases responsible for global warming, climate warming, and in order to take the reasoning further, we need to understand what their revolution is going to be and what kind of trend has been observed during the last few years. On the graph, we can see that the growth rate between 1970 and 2000 is 1%, 1.3%, and between 2000 and 2010, the growth rate is 2 0.3%. But what this indication really uh, reveals is an economic power redistribution, which is going to change the uh, rank, ranking of the countries that released the largest emissions in 2001. Globalization and the emergence of some economies, such as China, have led to uh, increasing emissions due to uh, industrial activities. And in 2007, these emissions crossed the curve of the uh, United States emission, which is an historic event because the United States were leading the pack in terms of countries that uh, were responsible for the largest quantity of emissions. Something else regarding the emissions. If we look at all the countries that in February of 2005 ratified the Kyoto Protocol, I will not go into too many details regarding the protocol itself. Suffice to say that the framework in which it was supposed to be implemented was a framework where about 50% of the convention signatories, who accounted for more than 55% of global emissions, were the minimum necessary for the Kyoto Protocol to be applied. So in 2005, 55 countries or more than 55 countries uh, met, in total 140 countries, and at the time they uh, accounted for more than 50% of the uh, world emission. Now, today these countries represent only 10% of the global emissions. The uh, pack of cards has been reshuffled and redistributed on the global level. And in terms of uh, economy and emissions, the situation has changed and the problem is picking up speed. And Gaston Berger in the 50s wrote, if one of us at the age of 60 can say he has lived in two worlds. If he is 30 years old, he has known two, two worlds instead of three. It took thousands of years for man to go from the speed of his, his own feet to that of uh, a galloping horse, 25 to 30 centuries to cover 100 kilometers in an hour. 50 years were sufficient for man to cross the barrier of sound.